going to be Ben's. He sits and rides shotgun in all the big All Black matches on Sky. 81 Test veteran for our country. He's twinkle toes along it. And try time. Oh my goodness, Smithy. I tell you what, left me speechless. Here's the decision. You can the try. Me, oh my, I have enjoyed that. Yes, boy. <laughs> I love it every time I hear it. Marshy, how are you doing, mate? Good, thanks, Marty. Very well, yourself? Very well. Okay, I gave it a B-minus, the all-black season at this stage of the campaign, given the ups and downs we've had. I think that mark is entirely fair. I've been really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it. If you had to give the all-blacks a grade for what we've seen so far. Uh, given what I've seen uh, this year, off the back of what I saw in November, oh, I couldn't go um, anything better than a C. To be perfectly honest, um, you know, a test series loss for the first time in history to Ireland, uh, losing to Argentina for the first time ever in our history in our own country, um, quite comprehensively beaten in South Africa and now split. Um, look, there's not a massive amount of positives in terms of that, that, that type of record, to be perfectly honest. Uh, there's certainly, yes, been some improvement, um, notably more recently. But by the usual high standards of what the All Blacks mantra lives by and by the way that we expect our All Blacks to play and how we expect them to preserve, protect and enhance our history, it's still not been good enough. All right, I'm going to break this down then. I've got lots of questions for you. Where are we strong? Where do we need to improve? Well, look, there's certainly been some improvement set piece-wise. Um, I, I, we always bully Australia, so we've got to be uh, very careful about uh, how we, we dominated them up front. The reason that they haven't won the Bledisloe Cup in 20 years is because it's the one team in the world the All Blacks have been out, able to out-physical. In recent years, particularly since the Rugby World Cup, the Northern Hemisphere teams with their bigger, more powerful players, particularly in the back row, have been... Uh, not intimidated and have not, not been out physical by the All Blacks, whereas we're, that is why we have struggled. And then, geez, I'll tell you what, nobody really out physical South Africa. So we've got to be careful about where we are physically. Um, so the two Australian test matches, um, you know, you, you take them into account with a slight grain of salt, but there is some improvement there. So I think we're trending the right way with the props and the Lucy's we're starting to pick. So there's been some improvement there. Um, in terms of our ability to want to play, um, it's looking a lot more positive. Uh, we are not kicking as negatively or conservatively as what we had done uh, over the past first part of the year. So that's an improvement uh, and that's a mindset and a shift. So those would be the two areas. Um, you know, halfbacks were strong, uh, first five were strong. And the outside backs, well, they're a bit jumbled up at the moment, but there's plenty of talent there. That's, and then probably Rico Ioane has made giant strides uh, in the 13 jersey. He's still got to get a lot better when he comes under massive pressure from outside to in line speed, like South Africa and the Northern Hemisphere teams will bring and bring his decision-making into question, but he certainly is really growing into that jersey, so I would consider him also to be a real positive. Justin Marshall is with us on the platform. All right, I've got so many questions to ask you just on the back of that. Loose forwards to start with, because we have Max on every week, and, and of course that's his area of expertise. He loves it, in a bit. He's, he's very doubtful about the combinations, wanting consistency in those combinations. I know that we've had injury problems. I mean, otherwise you'd think Shannon Frizzell's probably locked in number six. Do you have a preferential loose forward trio that you think is our number one at the moment? Or do you think that there's maybe four, five, six guys there and we have to interchange depending on opponent? I, I think we don't need to interchange. I, I certainly think we need to develop some consistency there. Like, how impressive was that uh, Irish back row? Man, they yeah, were, man. They were yeah. just super consistent, big, hard ball runners. They got over the ball as well. I really enjoyed the way they play. I love the French loose forwards as well. Um, and, and to a degree, the big looses at South Africa pick. I think we need to get to the point when we are picking Adi Savia at open side. And that, that will obviously mean some pain for possibly um, Dalton Papali'i or Sam Kane. Um, but I, I feel that's where we need to get to. Um, if we're going to pick him, we pick him on the side of the, side of the scrum where... 
he's probably our best player over the pool. Like, if you think about the amount of turnovers and big turnovers, Artie's usually there, scrambling on the line, getting us a turnover. He's playing like a seven. Um, and that's where we need to then develop that eight. And um, I'm just wondering whether that eight is Ethan Blackett or Cullen Grace. So, yeah, not there yet. I agree for Val, um, you know, or Scott Barrett, uh, probably the type of bodies we want on the blind side. But number eight's the position I feel we still need to resolve if we want to really move forward to where we need to get in that loose forward balance. Justin, these are tough conversations to have, and just bringing that up straight away, you know, you're, we all know what you're talking about. You're talking about the all-black captain there yep. not maintaining a place in the side. I mean, that's, you know, that's that's a monumental decision for the selectors. It's easy for us to talk about, but for them, it's, can you imagine them sitting down, having that conversation and following through with this? Yeah, or or bringing um, Artie uh, off the bench. Can, c- could you even fathom that? No. Um, if you feel that you need to continue to, you know, because Sam Kane was improving, getting better, his leadership obviously is um, paramount for the All Blacks. Uh, you know, does Artie come on as an impact player for 35 minutes or 30 minutes? I, I don't know. Look, he, does he need to be a victim of the fact that we are looking to try and solve a balance problem? Um, you know, he, he's not a he's not a line out option as number eight. Every other number eight in the world is a line out option. Um, Look, it's tough, you know. Like I'm, I'm not meaning this in respect of no, I know. any of those players not being able to fulfil their roles, not being able to do their job. But I feel just if the All Blacks really need to to make a massive leap in the right direction, we, we, we're never copycats. But the trend is now that you're not getting, as you know, 20 turnovers over the breakdown anymore. You know that that genuine feature for an open side. No other team in the world is playing that type of player anymore. Even Australia with Michael Hooper, even though he's got personal issues, he'd probably be the only player that comes to mind to me um, that is an open side player of the ilk of Richie McCaw. They're not around anymore, Devs. Mm. They, they, they have become obsolete. And we don't even really have one in New Zealand like Richie McCaw. Would Tom so, Christie be the nearest, do you think? Uh, yes. Yeah, to a degree, but his game is pretty well balanced um, because he, he carries hard as well. But, you know, he, he just gets through a mountain of, of tackling as well. So he, he's got a slightly different variant in his game. But, yeah, yeah p- possibly. But, um, look, that's just my personal opinion. Kind of. I feel that's where we need to go. I think it'll give us better balance across the ball in terms of ball runners, carries, offloads, distribution, line-out options, more power in our scrum, our set-piece. Our, our kickoff receipts. We've got bigger men, harder carriers, and bigger bodies that are cleaning rucks. That's just that's just my my observations of where I feel we need to get. This is why we got you on. This is why I love talking to you about it. Justin Marshall, eighty-one Test veteran for the All Blacks, with us. Okay, let's break before we get even get into the back line. As far as the front row goes, we seem to have abandoned the idea of the ball playing props. We seem to have. You know, a young burgeoning front row. We've got Simasoni, who just looks like an absolute dead set cert to wear that number two jersey as long as he wants it. As far as Ethan De Groot goes, as far as Fletcher goes, um, as far as uh, Tyrell Lomax goes, are you happy with what you saw with the revamped front row? Yeah, I think we, again, we are trending in the right direction. And um, you can certainly see all of those players that you mentioned growing in stature. The more minutes they get, the more they are learning about the intensity the physicality of Test Match Rugby, and particularly against the top sides in the world. Like, let's face it, at the moment, Australia, I think, are 10th. If they're not 10th, they're 9th in the world. Mm. Yeah, um, but when, when you come up against um, some of the, the, the more prominent teams in the world at the moment, that's when they'll start to learn even more. Um, again, they looked good at the weekend, w- which was great, because they physically dominated Australia, but... You know, my, my mindset is more, I'd like to see you do that against an England, Welsh, Scottish pack. You know, I'd, I'd like to see those um, improvements there. But they they will only improve. Um, they certainly are trending the right way in the type, type and style of game that they need to play. You know, they've got good good um, scrummaging power. They lift well in the line-outs. They're physical players. And, they, and they've got a little bit of mongrel in each about them. You know, so... Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, I think Tokiaho at the moment is probably the form hooker in the world. He's devastating. Justin, is why are you saying... Because, I mean, I suppose one good thing about this year so far is we've actually been able to see a Northern Hemisphere side 
a really strong side come down here with their A team and actually contest with us? Because I can't remember up. I know France beat us in 2009 in one of the tests, but traditionally that that tour, that June tour from the Northern Hemisphere is just. I mean, it's a gimme for the All Blacks, isn't it? And I think probably most of us thought that after the 41, what 19 win in Eden Park, which was half the bloody problem. Is my question is is are we starting to see now that we're going to have to have such a, a dynamic and changing squad that we actually adjust it for these different opponents? We play it different against Australia. We play it different against South Africa. We actually go again with different players or different combinations against Ireland? Or is that just wishful thinking? Is that pie-in-the-sky stuff? Look, I, I think we could make the odd tweak. Uh, you know, in terms of when we need a physical winger, because, you know, we have got that uh, aggressive defence that can cut out the wits in your game. There's possibilities to do that because they're asked to not stand on their wing and, and, and try and break or fracture the line at least um, to, to then enable there to be more space in the field. So, you know, that's one instance where you could probably swap a, a lighter player, Sever Reese, for a Caleb Clark. But, no, in general, I feel that we, we, we need consistency. You know, you look at our successful teams of the past um, that they had a really notable, reliable bench, one that was experienced and players knew their role within that team. They had a starting 15 that was super consistent. You know, you knew where your, you knew your centre combination was going to be non and Smith and that was that. You knew your back through was going to be Ben Smith, Corey Jane and Israel Bag. Yeah. You knew your back row was Kaino, McCaw, Reid, you know. It, it was very consistent and they, what they, what, look, mate, there's many times when I sat in an all-black changing room in a very good side, and we had some good sides in my time, um, you know, uh, 96, 97, and comparables, I think they called us, where I sat in, a, in changing rooms, you know, at Alice Park or whatever, and thought, how the hell did we win that test match? And then I looked around the room and thought, you know what, that's why. Because of the faces that I'm looking around this changing room at, because they've been to the cold face, they've been to World Cups, they've been in pressure situations, and they've learnt about each other We've learned to know even on a bad day, we can still get the job done. And that's what this team needs to learn. Like, they are having a bad day out in Christchurch. But they still should have found a way. Yeah. If they were more experienced, if it was a combination that had been to the coalface a lot more, had been consistency in selection, I felt they will still would have found a way to get that job done. As it turned out, Fozzie was throwing Stephen Pirafetta on with 50 seconds to yeah, go. Yeah, weird. And I'm thinking... What 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 yeah. what is that going <laughs> to do? Gonna you know, be, yeah. We we were looking we were looking for answers that weren't there. So no, I don't like us changing our the personnel dramatically. I would say one or two tweaks maximum for the opposition we come up against. Justin Marshall with us. Here's a, another perspective to put on the season. What say the 12 minutes at the end Joe Berg didn't happen? What say Bernard Foley had a kicked that ball out? We'd be talking completely differently, wouldn't we? Well, we would be, but those test matches are the type of test matches that you need to win. And, you know, all of those what-ifs are always involved in tight tight games. And, you know, that, that that's very much uh, the right side of the ledger that the All Blacks have fallen on. And, and certainly we would be in a, a lot worse place had had we dropped those two test matches. But we, in, in saying that, we did good things in those test matches that eventually meant that the team that faltered was the opposition, which was in South Africa... We built that 12 minutes, you know, over the other um, 68, you know, because they were fatigued. They, they were literally, they, they, yeah, they, 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 they had no one yeah. left on the bench. And everything that had been done up until that final 12 minutes was conducive to them hitting the wall. Um, and, and the Australian Test match, like, uh, equally. Yeah, look, you know, we, we got a hell of a good decision um, there, but... Australia were chasing that game the entire game. And, you know, it's fair play to them to get to that point, but they still had to get the job done and they didn't because of the work that was done previously. What does that mean to you as a player and the players around you? When, you know, I go back to that Melbourne test, mate, and I think, okay, Foley, whatever, decide whether you like it or not, the referee made that call. We still had to, at that stage, scrum. We had to win that scrum. We had to get, you know, our, our, yep. our positioning right. We had to come off the back of the scrum. We had to commit defenders. We still had to execute pass. Now, I go back to, I think it was 2018 when we were playing the box in Wellington and a similar situation happened right at the end. Damien mm. McKenzie didn't flick the pass. We lost that match. The mindset of the players that they did execute under pressure at that time, is that the kind of thing that you can describe as a turning point in a dressing room? Yep. Yes, I can. That was significant. It's probably the one 
that is the one, uh, I guess, quite conclusive positive that I took out of that test match was, yes, it was massively controversial and the game spiralled a little bit for a couple of minutes where everyone was like, what the hell is happening here? But then the test match still needed to be won against a very resilient team that had the edge and at that point in time, they had the game in their pocket. And what you needed to do is reach into their pocket and pull out that win from them. And you needed to make sure that you were accurate in doing that. And, you know, the scrum wasn't entirely that that solid, you know, they put pressure on there. Nick White was sweating all over Akira. I think I said this a couple of weeks ago, but you're right. Yes, it can. It can um, have that effect that I was talking about earlier, where those players sit in that changing room with the cold beer in their hand, uh, battered and bruised, and, and a little bit probably stunned because of what had just happened, um, and elated in yeah. the result yeah. and the way that they they achieved it. But also going, wow, we we can win those nail biters, boys. We, we, when we get opportunities, we can galvanise, we can get together, and we can win against the, the greatest of odds. And, and that does not only build confidence, but builds faith. Faith in the, the guy that you're sitting next to with that beer going, mate, giving him a nudge with your elbow going, good work. Good work. Good work. Next week now, next week, next week. Next time, make it so tight, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so as silly as it sounds, mate, when I'm talking to you, I forget that you, that you played so many test matches and that you're a player. You're a player who's become a media commentator as opposed to, you know, I mean, I, I know that sounds quite strange, but the reason I'm saying that is because I love hearing the fact that five and four isn't good enough for you. As a past player, it's not good enough. And we can sit here on this side of the television, the microphone, we can think what we like, but you more than anyone know, and, 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 it's, and it's you 1,200 men that have worn that jersey that know. And for me, that's so bloody significant because if you're not happy, then you have every right not to be happy. Yeah, and I can quite, um, without a shadow of a doubt, t- tell you um, in, a, in an honest uh, way that those 45 uh, people involved in the All Blacks, players, administrators, coaches, they'll, they'll be feeling exactly the same way. They're on the exterior, they, they won't say that because all that does when they do say that is um, culminate in more pressure on them um, because then the media grab a hold of it and, and they'll, they'll have a crack at them. Um, and it shows vulnerability. But, but I know, I know that the levels of perfection that the All Blacks seek, win ratio, um, um, and achieving all the right algorithms in a game and, you know, knocking that sort of 90% tackle uh, success rate, uh, having your errors below 10, having your, you know, your penalties below 10, all of those little key statistics in the game, they were, they were missing them big time. Um, possibly even missed them against Australia. Uh, and, in fact, the tackle rate was, was what was impressive. That was another massive positive to come out of that game. But I can tell you now, off the back of what you asked me, they will be feeling the same way. They will not be happy with where they're sitting at the moment, um, and they will be very determined to make significant changes to start hitting those um, achievement levels that we expect of our All Blacks. And they fi- expect them of themselves. And finally then, so, I mean, it's just... It's so poised now, isn't it? Everything that we think is good or we gained or improvements or on the right path, all the upward trends, all of that, it, it, is, it, it all now comes to play when we go to, mm. after Japan, and no disrespect to them, but to Wales, away, Scotland and England. All three of these teams are lined. I mean, how we perform in those three tests will say everything to you, right? Yeah, in my mind, Devs, um, depending on who we take away and who we're able to take, you know, does Anton Leonard Brown, Damien McKenzie yeah, right. uh, come back? into the mix in the back line. Uh, you know, do, do, do any of those players, um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Black Adders or whatever, are they in the mix? I don't think Black Adders. But anyway, regardless of that, we, I feel that by the time we get to that test match against England and we walk off t- Twickenham, haven't beaten, the, beaten them there because I can't handle walking no, out of that God, mate, it's a worst we haven't. God, you know. No. Um, Oh, Jesus. No There's no worse sport, place to lose. Is it? Like, God, do you hate no, it? Do you hate no. it more than any other place? Yeah, in the, yeah of course you do. Uh, I know you do. It's horrific. Yeah, you know, that, 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 that is not, that's a boulder under your towel <laughs> on the beach, not a, not a rock. But, um, but they, they need to have a very clear idea, barring injury, of the 15 guys that are going to start that World Cup game against France and Paris because they get nothing... For, the, for their following year. They've got no home test matches. They've got a very shortened version of the rugby championship where they only play each team once and then bang, they get the Rugby World Cup. I feel we need to go over there, win every single test match, all four of them, 
beat England at Twickenham, and that 15 is the 15 as close as possible, barring anybody that couldn't be there ruled out with injury that may force their way in, that'll be there for us at the Rugby World Cup come Paris opening game in September. Awesome, mate. Fantastic. That's where I want to see us. That's where I want to see us, mate. If, if, If we can be there by Christmas time, it'll be... Bordering on nearly an A from my C today. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. There is hope for this student. Thank you, Justin, as always. Justin.